Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here in the house of the Lord today. It's good to see you every day. I am just going to take this time to welcome everyone who's tuning in online. We're very happy to have you joining in. And we're going to start out our worship this morning with a song about the house of the Lord. So please stand and join us, everyone.
Father God, we ask you just to be in our presence this morning, Lord, and we ask you to be with the message this morning, and that the message that comes out is what you want those that are here listening to you to hear, God. And we ask those that need to hear you from home, Lord, um, to be tuned in, and that what you have in plan and what your will is, God, be done in their lives as well as ours, God. We just ask you to use us as vessels. It is all about you this morning. It is not about us. And we are here to worship you, God. And we love you and we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have given us in this life, God. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I come to the garden. As we prepare ourselves to continue our service today, I challenge you to think about how awesome our God is. Think about the wonders of the universe. We've seen so many pictures this week from the Space Telescope. We think of the wonders of the microscopic world that we've seen also. Our God is awesome. He is the God of creation. He's created the Sabbath, the day of rest, the day of worship. And we say, to God be the glory. Heavenly Father, we turn to you today in humbleness at your awesome power, your awesome love, and 
how you can reach out to those that are at home and those that may see this later on this week. We're just so grateful for this, understanding our worship time with you is not because it's a clubhouse for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. Remembering, I am a sinner. And perhaps I need a Band-Aid today. Perhaps I need a prescription. Read the Bible every day. That's your prescription. Maybe it's more serious than that. And as we try to prepare ourselves, is it time for an infusion? Is it time for a transfusion? Or is it time for a transplant? Transplanting God's love into yours. We need to remember we're doing this for you, Lord. Because we think our happiness is what we need to achieve. But happiness is fleeting. Happiness is something that we've made. The joy of the Lord. That's from Jesus. That's for time eternal. I pray that we find the joy of Jesus in today. And that we be blessed in our humble adoration of our Lord today. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve, for that, that prayer this morning. And uh, at this time, I see a bunch of kiddos here, and so we're going to let them uh, head on downstairs for, for their, uh, their lesson today so they can meet, uh, meet their teachers in, in the back. Great to see so many kids here with us today. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody doing all right? Good, good. All right, by a show of hands, how many of you like a good story? Anyone like a good story? Yeah, I think, I think most of us like a good story, right? Uh, stories entertain us. Stories, they make us think. They capture our attention. They teach us. Uh, sometimes they make us laugh. Other times they make us cry. Sometimes they do both at the same time. Uh, but the Bible is full of stories. In fact, about half of the Bible is different stories that tell a bigger story. And sometimes these stories are serious. And other times uh, they might have, they might be kind of sad. And then others, they're very happy. The ending one is very happy that we have to look forward to. But God teaches us through stories. And so this morning we are going to be reading two simple stories from the book of Luke. And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you uh, to open them or to scroll to them if they're on your phone uh, to Luke chapter 18 this morning, Luke chapter 18. And so one of these stories that we're going to talk about is about a poor blind man who is desperate for healing. And the other one is about a rich tax collector, an outcast in Jewish society, who surprises us with his humble response to Jesus. So let's jump right on in uh, with our first story. We're going to be Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, 
Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and he ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Isn't that a great story? Well, this, this story is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Mark's gospel, in his account, he tells us that this blind man's name is Bartimaeus. Great name, Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus is a desperate man. He is blind, and as a, as a result of that, he is unable to work for a living. And so by his poverty and his inability to be able to do meaningful work, he is forced to be in this position to beg for anyone and anything that he can get. And it's hard to imagine being in a much lower, much more desperate place than Bartimaeus is in this story. But on this day, he hears this commotion on the road. So he's, he's listening to everything going on, and all of a sudden he hears something is brewing, something is happening, something big, something different. And so he's asking, he's like, what is, what's going on? And finding out that it's Jesus, he begins to loudly call out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. All right? And those walking ahead of Jesus, so imagine this big old crowd that is, that is following and walking with Jesus and those who are in front of Jesus, they begin to scold this beggar. They begin to put him down. They become, begin to tell him, hey, you need to be quiet. <laughs> and it's an apparent that they find Bartimaeus either really annoying or they believe that he is not worth Jesus's time. So Bartimaeus, of course, listens to them right? And he, and he keeps his mouth shut. No, he doesn't. Not at all. He's, he goes loudly, more loudly. And wouldn't you, if you were in that spot, wouldn't you want to get Jesus' attention too? And so he goes once again, even louder. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And so as a dad of two young boys, this kind of makes me smile. Because I think about this, uh, this happens in my house, right? A little, boy, little brother keeps talking, keeps asking for things. Um, and, and the more he asks, the louder he becomes. And we have a big brother there who's saying, hey, shh, be quiet. Stop talking. No, you're annoying, right? We have this played out. And so, uh, you know, does, does little brother listen to that and, and, and get more quiet and, and listen? No, he doesn't. <laughs> He gets louder, right? He gets louder. So I can, I, can see, I can see where this is happening, where this is going. But Bartimaeus is not shouting to annoy those who are with Jesus. That's not his target. His target is Jesus. He wants to captivate and get a hold of Jesus because he knows who Jesus is. He is the son of David. The one who is prophesied in the Old Testament, this coming king was here who would deliver his people and he was walking right past him. And so he tries to get his attention. And perhaps maybe the most surprising thing to that crowd was that Jesus stopped for him. I'm sure there was other people that were shouting out at him and I'm sure all the people around him were trying to get their attention. But here is this blind beggar who everyone's trying to silence and he's yelling out, and Jesus stops. Bartimaeus is then brought to Jesus as he calls for him, and he asks him this question, what do you want me to do for you? What would you answer, Jesus, <laughs> if he asked you, what do you want me to do for you? I think that's a good question. But Jesus desperately wants to hear what Bartimaeus has. And Bartimaeus asks for one thing and one thing only. So one simple but very profound thing, and he, he just simply wants to see. That's understandable. He's blind. He wants to see. He's blind. He's, he's shut out from the world. He's considered an outcast in that day. He can't work, and so all he can do is beg people, and he just 
wants to see. And Jesus, being so awesome, right? Being so full of mercy and grace, he kindly and so powerfully gives him this simple command, and he says, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Receive your sight. That's so powerful, and imagine that happened, and his eyes opened, and he could see the world. Beautiful picture here. Now imagine with me being in that crowd that day. I, I, I'm someone who I like to try to find myself in the shoes of what's happening here because I can connect with it. I can vision it. All right, so put yourself in that crowd that day. You are following Jesus, and you know Barty quite well, right? He's there on the road every day, and so sometimes as you're passing him, sometimes you say a quick hi, sometimes you ask him how he's doing. Maybe occasionally you drop him a little bit of money, right? You've seen him. And just three minutes earlier, you were yelling at him to keep his mouth shut, right? Thinking, you're annoying. Plus, Jesus, I know you, Barty, and Jesus doesn't have time for you. Don't bother this Messiah. But yet, here, here we are. And Jesus stops in his tracks. And he turns to Bartimaeus and he calls for him. And he brings him out and he gives him his undivided attention. And then he heals him. He gives him his sight. And Bartimaeus' whole demeanor has now changed, right? Instead of begging and feeling sorry for himself and hopeless, he is now in this beautiful picture of being overjoyed. And he's dancing in the streets of, with joy. And you just can't help but smile for the man. I mean, you know his story. You know what it, it's been rough. And so even though you feel a little guilty down inside that you were the one who was shushing him to be quiet, and now all of a sudden Jesus, who you were walking with, makes it all about him and heals him, you're still deep down happy for him, and you celebrate with him, and you begin to praise God along with everyone else. And Bartimaeus is praising God, and then it says that he begins to follow Jesus, which I think is so powerful that when he has this encounter with Jesus, he then begins to follow him. His life on earth is now it will never be the same again because of this encounter with Jesus. He can now live normally. He can now see his family and he can now find meaningful work. No wonder why he wants to follow this Jesus guy. It's just such a beautiful story. And I think it's worth pointing out here at this time that um, about this story that it falls after this other story that we read a little bit earlier in Luke chapter 18 of Jesus um, who is approached by a rich young ruler. And this, this rich young ruler, I mean, he had everything, right? He had, he had money, he had influence, he had youthfulness. And Jesus challenges this young man about his idol. And his idol was his wealth. This guy, he said, I, I've kept all the commandments. I've done all the right things. I've, I've followed you. I love you. What am I missing and Jesus says, it's, it's your idol. It's, it's your wealth. You love money. And he says, give it up. Give it all away to the poor. And what does he do? This young ruler is unwilling to give it up. He said that he loves God, but when it came down to it, it was apparent that he loved money more. And he walked away sad. He walked away sad. And now let's compare that rich young ruler to Bartimaeus' story, okay? So the rich young ruler, he had everything, but he leaves with nothing, and he's sad. Bartimaeus, on the other hand, had nothing. He was begging. He was poor, but he leaves with everything after encountering Jesus, and he's left rejoicing, right? What a contrast there. One author calls this the great reversal. I like that a theme that we see throughout Luke's gospel, the great reversal. Those who seem to have everything here on this earth walk away with Jesus with nothing. But those who seem to have nothing to offer, Jesus finds everything. They find forgiveness. They find healing, salvation, and life. So you might be asking, what makes the difference? Who finds God's blessing and salvation. Well, I think it's the one who humbly recognizes their need 
for God's mercy. Do you recognize your great need for the mercy of God in your everyday life? That's what it is. Humble yourself with that. You need God's mercy. And who is rich before God? I believe it's the one who follows Jesus by faith, right? Because God's treasure comes through faith in his son, Jesus. Now, others around you, they might have more money. Some might have better health. They might have more talent, more advantages in this life, maybe. But for the one who has nothing in this world compared to others, yet knows Jesus and is humble before him, they're the ones that have everything. In Jesus' world, they inherit the kingdom of God. They get everything. It is turned around. It is beautiful. So let's read our second story now. Let's go a little bit ahead. Uh, Luke chapter 19, starting verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be with the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, our second story begins with some interesting details. Scripture mentions that Zacchaeus was wealthy. He was the chief tax collector. Um, so he would have been the most prominent, the, the top guy in charge of all the other tax collectors. So he's the, the top guy, meaning that he got wealthy and took money away from people wrongfully. That was his job. That's what he did. That's what he trained others to do. And these tax collectors were known to take more than what the Roman government asked to take. So he would add on extras and extra money and would take people's money wrongfully. And essentially he became wealthy because he was stealing, right? And so one of my commentaries made mention that Zacchaeus would have been considered in that day um, as the worst of all sinners. Tax collectors were really bad sinners, but he was the top one. He was the chief one. So he was the worst of all sinners. And for this reason, you would probably know that Jewish tax collectors like him were despised by their fellow Jews, which would help us to understand why the crowd was upset with how Jesus responded to this chief tax collector. Now, we don't really know why Zacchaeus was so desperate to see Jesus. I mean, we know that he heard about him, so he was wanting to see, but obviously, it was clearly evident that he was curious about who this Jesus was. He is, he's heard these things, of these miracles that he's done all across the region, and he's coming to see. He's, he's curious. He wants to check this out. But Luke also mentions that Zacchaeus was short. And so there was a big crowd there, and he wanted to see Zacchaeus, but he couldn't see over the, over the people. So he takes it in his own hand. He sees this tree, and he goes and he climbs up it, Right? So he was able to see Jesus, and Jesus passes by. He's looking at the crowd, but he notices Zacchaeus up in the tree. And it's crazy to me, but Jesus calls him by name and invites him to come down and invites himself over to his house. I mean, imagine meeting a stranger that you've never met before, and all of a sudden you say, 
hey, guess what? I'm coming over to your house later. I hope you have the meal ready. <laughs> what would you do? You'd be like, what? Like, I'm not ready for this. I don't even know you. Like, why should I trust you? But here is Zacchaeus, and he is gripped, man. He's so excited. He's like, yo, this, like, this Jesus guy, like, he, he, he called me by name. Like, he, he knew me, and he wanted to be with me. Nobody else here wants to be with me. He wants to be with me. So he's pumped. And Zacchaeus' response is so much different than the young ruler that we mentioned about earlier. Because the rich young ruler, remember, left sad. But here is Zacchaeus, and he's glad, right? So what's the difference here? Well, again, the rich ruler would not yield. In his pride, he would not give up his idol called money. But Zacchaeus, however, he was hungry for something more. And he felt something with Jesus in that interaction with him that, he, that gave him more satisfaction than his wealth did. And in this moment of humility and repentance, Zacchaeus relinquished his hold on money and he told Jesus that he was gonna, he's committed to giving away half of everything that he owned to the poor and to those that he mistreated, which was a lot of people. He was gonna give them four times what he took from them. I mean, talk about this life change that had happened, right? And so um, what's interesting is that Jesus said right after this, he says, salvation has come to this house. And some of you might have had this question like I had when I was reading this. I was like, hmm. So was Jesus saying that Zacchaeus was saved because he gave his money away? I mean, wouldn't that be contrary to the gospel of grace through faith alone? I don't know if anyone else has thought that, but I, I definitely wrestled with that. But I think that there was more uh, that was deeper within this conversation, that was deeper within this encounter that would catch our eye. Because Jesus said not only that salvation has come to this house, but he, he gives a reason. He says, because Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. Now, what does that really mean? I mean, Zacchaeus was a son of Abraham, just like all the other Jewish people that were there with him. Why? Well, because he was, he was Jewish too, right? But it was, I think it was more than that. It was because he walked by faith. Abraham was a man of faith and was declared righteous. He was saved because he had faith in the living God. And apparently Zacchaeus had shown Jesus that he had faith, which reminded him of the faith that Abraham had. So imagine this. It's, there's this seeking sinner, the worst of all sinners. The seeking sinner had met a seeking Savior. In true repentance and turning away from his previous life of greed, Zacchaeus had found a personal salvation in Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' words of today, salvation has come to this house, was an assurance of salvation to Zacchaeus. But it was also a proclamation to the crowd that was gathered around him and a promise for all people in every land, in every age, including us today, that Jesus Christ saves all sinners. Thank you. I, I was hoping I'd get an amen on that. He saves all sinners. And that is good news because I am one of those all sinners. All right. I desperately need Jesus. I need what he's done for us. So I want to I wanna take just a, a quick minute just to go through um, some quick comparisons between uh, these two stories. Okay. First of all, both men, they were outcasts, right? One of them was extremely poor. The other one was extremely wealthy, but both of them were considered outcasts in their day. Both men wanted to see Jesus. That's the next point, Henry. Both men wanted to see Jesus. One of them was blind, so he wanted to see him for his own eyes. The other one was short and needed to get higher to see Jesus. In both stories, Jesus made time for the outcast. That's, that's good news. He he saw both of them, right? The crowds didn't see the man. They didn't see them as being worth Jesus' time. But Jesus saw both of them, right? And in both stories, Jesus made time for the outcast, right? He made time for him. 
He, he was pa- just passing by. He, if you look into the stories, it says that he was passing by. He was on his way to Jerusalem, which he was eventually going to be gonna, handed over and was going to be killed on the cross. That's where he was heading. That was his final destination. But Jesus didn't let his final destination, the, the things that he had planned, he didn't let that stop and, and take away from making time for these two outcasts. Another thing that I noticed is that both of these men were lost. They were hopeless. They were lost. They didn't, they thought they had everything, but they didn't, right? But Jesus saved them both. It was evident that Jesus changed the lives of both of these men. That's what Jesus does. He changes lives. And all that we have talked about this morning comes back to the simple question. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? I mean, why did Jesus leave heaven and come down into this world that he created, that humans that we messed up because of our sin? Why did he do that? Why did he stop for these two men? Why did he go over to Zacchaeus' house? Why did Jesus come? Well, Jesus made his purpose on earth very clear to us in this passage. It says he came to seek and to save the lost. You see, Jesus, he was a great teacher. I would have loved to sit under Jesus' teaching. Obviously we are, but I would love to have heard him in person. He was also a perfect and moral person. He never messed up. So we can look to him and we can see, wow, that is perfection. That is how you are supposed to live, right? We can look to him as that. He was a prophet from God. But we can't just stop there. We have to understand his overarching purpose was to save lost souls because Jesus came for the broken. Jesus came for the outcast, for the lowly, for the sinners like you and I. He came for us. He came for the the worst of sinners like this despised tax collector. And Jesus didn't just come for the wealthy and for those who were popular but he came for the ones who were poor. He came for the ones who were unseen. That's who Jesus is. And as we remember that Jesus initiated this relationship with Zacchaeus' life, he also wants this relationship with us. He saw this grown man sitting up in the tree and he called out to him and he told him that he was going to go to his house And Jesus knew what kind of man he was engaging with. He knew all of what he's done. He knew his position quite well. He knew how other people felt against him. He knew what he was dealing with. But he still saw the man's need and his hunger for a different life than what he was living. And so we look at the scriptures, we look at the gospels, and we see story after story after story of how Jesus demonstrates that he came to seek and to save the lost. I think back on the sinful woman in Luke chapter 7 who who wept over Jesus' feet, fell at his feet, and began weeping over at the Pharisee's house, and, and Jesus forgave her many sins. I think back on the 10 lepers in Luke chapter 17 who were outcasts to their society, but Jesus healed them. To the woman at the well, he engaged with her. The blind beggar named Bartimaeus who had no hope, but Jesus gave him sight. Zacchaeus, a lion cheating, greedy extortionist who was hated by people, but he found salvation and he found a friend in Jesus. So today, friends, let's be reminded of this simple yet profound gospel message of Jesus Christ. That salvation and forgiveness and healing and hope and true life is only found in Jesus Christ, who so willingly and mercifully and lovingly offers it to us too. If you're listening today and you haven't yet put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that you have a Savior who sees you. He sees you and he loves you 
and he died for you. Yes, even you. You might think, how could this God die for me? I, I'm too broken. You are not too broken for Jesus. He loves you no matter what you have done. And I believe he is the unseen one that is here with us today. And he has come to seek you. He's come to save you. If you will just open up your heart and just say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I want my life to count. I want it to be different. I want you to change my life. And if you are here today and you have been saved by placing your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, here is my challenge for all of us today. In light of the message today, in light of of what Jesus has done for us by saving us, by dying on the cross and his blood that was shed for us on that cross for the forgiveness of our sins for us. Can we be challenged in this way? Can we be challenged today that we look at people, not just some people, not just the people that we want to look like, that we want to look at, not just the people that have our same beliefs, but can we look at all people with Jesus's eyes? That's a challenge. Can we look at every single person that we interact with, that we rub shoulders with, can we look at them with the love and the grace and the purpose of Jesus Christ? The truth is that that so often we find ourselves like those in in the crowds of the two stories. We are so easy to judge others and to think that other people are too far gone from the saving grace of Jesus But can I just simply remind us this morning that Jesus died for all. He died for every single person. There is not not a person on this earth who has ever lived or who is living today that Jesus didn't love and doesn't love and uh, didn't die for. He died for everybody. And that is good news. So church, it is time for us to be known by our love again to see the people that are going unseen. It's time for us to extend mercy and grace and hope to this dying and lost world around us. We cannot lose sight of this. We are called to be a light in the dark and broken world. We are called to be a beacon of hope to show those who are lost that there is in fact a better way to live and that is through Jesus. And so may our words and our actions be seasoned with salt. And we may, may we always see the people that most others ignore. It will be then and only then that we truly begin to look different and we begin to look more like Jesus. Friends, Jesus is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? You guys believe that? If so, then let us follow the way of how we are to live our lives and how we are to look at others. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't just come for the people who had it all together. He came for those who desperately need him, who are lost There are so many people in our world that are lost. So many people that are in the grocery stores that we we shop at. So many of our neighbors, so many of our coworkers, some family members maybe. There are so many people that need to see Jesus and know who he is and what he's like. How are they going to know unless you step in and you tell them about this great Jesus? Not that we have it perfect, but that we have a perfect Savior who all of us need. Let's extend that together. Let's humbly receive this message today and let us rejoice with all of our hearts. Let's pray together. And as I pray, I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up and lead us in our response song. Heavenly Father, God, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospels that we can read and, and be able to understand And seek to understand more of who Jesus was, how he lived, who he spent time with, how he interacted with people. And God, I I have to confess that 
I haven't always gotten it right. I haven't always seen everybody that I've walked past. Sometimes I've gotten so caught up in my own way, my own thinking, that I can sometimes get boggled down by the things that I think are important. And I lose sight of what our true mission is as followers of you, that, that we're on mission with you, that you're wanting to use us to be a light in this world so that others can come into a personal relationship with you. So God, I pray that you would help us to see through your eyes, not to just walk past people and just go about our own business. Yes, we got things to do. Yes, we have to work. There are necessary things in this world. We understand, but God, help us to remember that we have a different calling. We have a different purpose. And that is to be unified with our Savior in how we are to live in this world. God, help us to seek people out and help us to point others to you. And Father, I pray for anyone who may be listening here or online today. And I don't know why, they, why they're here, but I, I believe that it's because you are seeking them. I don't think it's a coincidence that they're hearing this message today. And, and God, I just, I just pray that they would have the curiosity as Zacchaeus and that they would respond in that same way and realize that they need to be humbled before you and realize that they are sinners, they are broken, just like all of us, and that they need a savior. They need someone to save them from their sin. And so, God, I pray for them right now that they would just simply open up their hearts and that they would just simply say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. I pray that they would just hold on to that. And Lord, that you would, as you did with these two men, that you changed their lives. I pray that you would change these people's lives who are deciding to say yes to you today. God, you are the miracle worker. God, there is nothing that you can't do. And there is nobody too far gone from you. God, salvation is for everyone who will just believe and trust in you. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for dying on that cross for all of us. Thank you for seeking us, for seeing us, for knowing us, for calling us by name. And God, for making us new and then wanting to use us in this world. So God, fill us with you. Help us to receive this word today and, and be changed by it. Help us to be challenged by this. We need you, Lord, and we love you back. Thank you for first loving us. God, help us to respond to you now as we sing this song. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you all to stand this morning. And if anyone feels led to come to the altar and pray, or they need someone to pray with them, Pastor Kevin is right here on the front row, and there are many people willing to sit with you and pray with you. So let's continue our worship this morning. All things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant praise remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought. 
Be seated. It was great to be able to, to worship you, worship God with you, <laughs> um, and uh, we're, we're really glad um, that, you, that you are here and that you're a part of our live stream. Um, just a couple, uh, couple things um, before we go today. Um, the first thing is uh, we're doing this fellowship time right after we're done here, so we encourage you to stick around. Um, meet somebody new, get to know somebody a little bit better. This is what this time is, is set aside for so that we can get to know each other because we are a family and we need each other. And, uh, and I encourage you to, to stick around, even if it's just for a few minutes, if, if it's just one person, I encourage you to, to stick around and, and hang out. Uh, we also, for those of you who have signed up to be teen prayer partners, uh, we're going to be having um, a meeting, just a, f a few minutes. We'll give maybe like five minutes just uh, if you want to want to talk and mingle a little bit. But if you signed up for that, if you can meet me in the teen room, um, we will, I won't keep you long. I know we got lunch plans and those kind of things, but we want, uh, we want to be able to give you uh, the, the teen prayer card and be able to go over a couple things, some helpful things for you, some resources. So um, if you could just join me in the teen room uh, here after service, that would be great. Um, also, if, if those, maybe you didn't sign up for it, but you're like, you know what, I, I want to do that. We have a few more teens that we would love to, to partner with you. So uh, come stop by after service. 
Um, we also, uh, we have our offering uh, boxes in the back. If you want to uh, drop on your tithes and offerings, you can put those in there. You can also give online or on our church app. Um, that's available as well. Um, this is uh, something that we were made aware of uh, this week, but uh, the insurance company that we um, share kind of the parking lot with, they're going to be resurfacing that parking lot next Sunday. And so we're not going to be able to park there. So um, we're going to have someone here who's going to help with the parking situation, let you know where to park as our, as our spots fill up. Um, but just wanted to give you a heads up about that. We're sorry for any inconvenience with that for this one week. Um, but hopefully we'll get that, get that taken care of. Um, also, uh, we have VBS coming up, Vacation Bible School. So it's where we have kids from our community, kids in our church that come together. And we, we have a dedicated week that we pour into them um, on, at the evenings, Monday through Thursday. It's going to be August 8th through 11th. And uh, obviously, we need some caring adults that will, that will come and, uh, and help love on these kids. Um, if you're good with kids, we, we have spots for you. If you're not good with kids and you want to be behind the scenes, we have things behind the scenes as well. So um, we really need as many people as, as can volunteer for that. Um, we also have a sign-up sheet for, um, for those who, are, uh, who can help volunteer um, and, and be able to volunteer as far as uh, providing a dinner for our volunteers. And so if you uh, maybe can cook a meal or provide a meal, um, we are looking for people. There is a um, sign-up link in our, in our notes, but it was wrong. And so we're sorry for that. There's like a couple letters that were different. Um, so, it, so don't put that link in, but we'll send out the correct one this week. Uh, but uh, let's see, I think Pam, Pam Scott. Pam Scott is the one who you need to see, so she's right here. Um, so she has the correct link that she can give to you. So if, if that's something that you can help out with with a dinner, please see Pam after service, okay? Um, we also, uh, we're trying to get our, our kids signed up. So if you know of any kids, um, please Point them to our website, okay? Point our, the, the parents to the website so that they can get uh, the kids signed up and be a part of VBS. It's going to be a great time. Um, so if you have any questions, you can see Joy Booth. You can come talk to me about that. We'd love to, love to get you plugged in, get our kids, kids there. So those are the announcements I have. There's obviously a lot more. I didn't go over all of them. So check out the announcements. Make sure you know what's coming up. Ways to get plugged in. I um, hope you take full advantage of that, all right? Um, but we are dismissed, but let me uh, give us a benediction as we go, okay? Know that you are loved, that you are seen, and may we go now and may we see with Jesus' eyes, and may we extend his love to everybody we meet. You are dismissed. May God bless you. Your love.